here is Brother Danny Douglas. He's been preaching the gospel for around 30 years, over 30 years. Included in this time has been some 10 years in public education. He's worked locally with Churches of Christ in Lawrenceburg, Columbia, Mount Pleasant, Ardmore, Tennessee, Elizabethtown, Kentucky, Floyd, Chesapeake, Portsmouth, Virginia. Tell me how you say Gallipolis. Gallipolis. Gallipolis, Ohio. And I always can hear it and say it when I hear it. When I see it on paper, it doesn't come out that way. Gallipolis, Ohio. And since the fall of 2007, he's labored with the Dresden Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. He's preached over the radio for 23 years and speaks in gospel meetings and lectureships on a regular basis. He is the editor of uh, the paper Standing Fast, and there are copies of it out in our track right. We recommend it highly to everyone. For three and a half years, he did evangelistic work in the Ukraine and also in the United Kingdom, where he met his wife, Larnie. And they have two children, Lydia Six and Daniel Moses, three. And uh, I knew him before he knew them. In fact, we met in the UK and count him a very dear friend. And it says here he's thankful to the Lord for these many blessings and opportunities. And that's something we can't say enough of for all of our blessings from God. He's a great gospel preacher. We appreciate him very much for his work's sake in the Lord. He'll be speaking on God's plan for unity. Ephesians chapter 4. Brother Danny, please come speak to us. <clears throat> Thank you for the privilege to be here tonight. I'm thankful for the faithful congregation here at Spring of the Lord's Church, for the sound and godly elders, and for Brother Brown and his great ability and faithfulness to the Lord and to the truth. It's also an honor to be with all these other faithful brethren here in the lectureship and to be with all the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ this week. I thank the Reigns family for putting me up and putting up with me this week in their home. I appreciate them and the opportunity to be with them. Back in 1990 at the Free Hardeman Lectureship, Brother Leroy Brownlow, famous for his excellent book, Why I'm a Member of the Church of Christ, delivered a lecture on the preservation of the faith. He began his lecture by saying that liberals remind me of the old farmer who kissed his mule. And he explained it this way, well, every man to his own choosing. But his neighbor down the street didn't want to kiss his mule. He wanted only to kiss his wife. And he was called a legalist. And today, I have an idea that some people might be calling us legalists here. Or even some who used to stand for the truth might be calling us radical extremists or unbalanced or something like that. But I still don't want to kiss my mule. <laughs> but I don't have a mule. But I want to kiss my wife. But if I did have one, a mule that is, <laughs> I wouldn't want to kiss it. But sadly many brethren who've been faithful in the past are now kissing the proverbial mule. Beloved, tonight, the faithful are still in unity with God. The faithful are still in unity. What bemoans us and saddens our hearts is that many who were once faithful are no longer in unity with the Lord and with his true people. It's inconceivable that the Lord would leave his precious body of the church in the hands of human innovation when it comes to unity. He might as well leave the church in the hands of humans regarding the plan of salvation, that is, the devising of a human plan, a human plan for worship, work, and organization of the church. And of course, none of this has he done. 
In Ephesians 3, 10 and 11, to the intent that now in the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church was in the eternal plan and purpose of God. The church is described in Acts 20, 28 as the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. This is the church of which Jesus said, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it in Matthew 16 and verse 18. We know that if God left his church in the hands of human innovation and human direction when it comes to unity, it would be a disaster. God is not the author of confusion but of peace, 1 Corinthians 14 and 33. But, beloved, tonight what we have, in many cases in the brotherhood, is truly a spiritual disaster because men are now trying to take over God's unity plan and put their plan in effect rather than executing the divine plan according to the pattern to which we are to hold fast, 2 Timothy 1 and verse 13. The Lord's church is too precious to be left in human hands. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, Ephesians 5, verse 25. What a powerful and beautiful statement the Lord makes in his great prayer of John 17. It's been referred to on numerous occasions during this lectureship, where first of all, even before we get to verse 20, Jesus prayed that the apostles would be one as we are. And we know just a few verses later, that which separated and distinguished them from the world and set them apart was the word, the truth. And that is the thing that separates and sanctifies all disciples of the Lord from the world. Jesus prayed in John 17, verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. And then he prayed, Neither pray I for these alone, that is not just for the apostles, but for all them also which shall believe on me through their word, that thou may be one, Father, as thou art in me, and I in thee, that thou also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Now we notice here that these would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ through the words given to the apostles that the apostles would convey to mankind. And therefore, this prayer is not in regard to unity in the sectarian world or the denominational world, because the sectarians and denominationalists have not heard the pure gospel that the apostles conveyed. So it has to be talking about unity among God's people, the church. But now, how is unity attained and maintained? Unity with God and Christ and all the faithful is attained by faithful obedience to the commandments of the Lord. It is maintained in the same way. However, it is initially attained by obedience to the gospel plan of salvation. When a person obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ, that which causes them to be divided from God is removed. And Saul obeyed the gospel, Ananias said to him, And now why tarriest thou, arise and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Shortly and immediately after that, Saul was baptized. That which washes away our sins is the precious blood of Christ. In Ephesians 2 and verse 13, Paul speaks to the Ephesians who had obeyed the gospel, But now in Christ Jesus you who sometimes were far off, are made nigh by the blood of Christ. That is a beautiful and powerful statement regarding unity. Man, sinful man, comes to Christ through obedience to the gospel. His sins are removed, and he is brought near unto God. We know that the precepts of Ephesians chapter 4 indicate to us God's unity plan. 
In verse number three, we are to endeavor, that is, to give diligence, to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. And then he said, there is one body and one Spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. In the book of Acts, we find precept exemplified. We see the principles of Ephesians chapter 4 exemplified in those who obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. They heard the one faith revealed by the one Spirit through the apostles. They believed and obeyed the one faith, the gospel message. They believed on and submitted to the one Lord. In obedience to the one message, they submitted to the one baptism. And upon doing that, they claimed the one hope. And they were added to the one body of the church. And we know, furthermore, they became worshipers of the one true and living God. In verse 38, they were commanded, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In verse 41, we know that when they did this, they came into unity with the existing group of the Lord's followers. Because we read, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In verse 47, we see what they were added to and who did the adding. Is the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved? And thus they entered into biblical unity. They entered into unity with God and Christ and all the faithful. Moreover, we see that all of those who remained faithful and steadfast maintained unity with God and the faithful. In verse 42, And they continued steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. In 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, John said that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. This is continuous action, continuing walking in the light as we continue walking in the light. We continue to be cleansed by the blood of Christ, which makes our closeness with God possible. And several years ago, Brother J. Ridley Stroop, a late professor of David Lipscomb College, wrote a book concerning why people do not see or understand the Bible alive. I'm sure that many of the preachers here have that book. I've taken that book, young preachers, and I've made radio sermons out of that material. It's excellent material. And Brother Stroop in this book has as the thesis that we can, we must, and we should see the Bible alive. But sadly today, those of what is now called David Lipscomb Educational Institution, now called David Lipscomb University, would not agree with Brother J. Ridley's truth. But now why is God's unity plan called the unity of the Spirit? We notice that it is called the unity of the Spirit because the Spirit has brought to us that upon which true unity is founded, the Word of God. In Ephesians 6, 17, the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. David said, the Spirit of the Lord was in my tongue, 2 Samuel 23, 2. Paul said that we, that as we inspired men, speak with the words which the Holy Ghost teacheth, 1 Corinthians 2, 13. And regarding the old prophets, the holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, 2 Peter 1, verse 21. The Spirit brought the gospel down from heaven according to 1 Peter 1 and verse 12. And thus we understand why God's plan for unity is called the unity of the Spirit. It is based upon and can only be possible by obedience to the Word of God that the Spirit has brought unto man. Let us notice carefully the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, in verse number four. This is the American Standard Version. In verse number three, he, by implication, Paul does, state that we are baptized in unity with the Lord. And in verse four, he states it directly. 
In verse number 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. And then in verse number 4, we were buried therefore with him through baptism unto death. You like as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. That's Romans 6 and verse number 4. To further solidify the point of how we have unity with God, the Apostle John declared in 2 John in verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine that is the teaching of the Christ hath both the Father and the Son. Now as we look at the seven ones of Ephesians chapter 4, we see the reason for the unity of the Spirit. This is the foundation upon which God's unity plan, the divine platform of unity, rest. It is that upon which it is based. In verse number four, we see unity of organization. There is one body. That's unity of organization. And Christ is the head of the body of the church, Colossians 1, verse 18. There is one church. Then we see that there is unity of revelation, in that there is only one Spirit, that is, one Holy Spirit. We remember that Jesus promised the apostles that when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And then in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 10, regarding those things which God hath prepared, prepared for them that love him, Paul said, But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now there is only one way that God guides us, and that is through the Word that the Spirit has brought to us, contrary to the doctrine of Mac Beaver. And those who go along with them, such as Terry Varner, Charles Pugh, and others. The Spirit does not operate directly upon the heart of man apart from the Word. It is only through the Word of God, the sword of the Spirit. But also in verse number 4, we see unity of aspiration. Because Paul said there is only one hope. The Christian hope is the hope of eternal life which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. The inspired writer of Hebrews describes it in a wonderful way when he speaks of the Christian hope as the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. As the anchor keeps the ship in place and keeps it from drifting out to sea, so the hope that we have in Christ of eternal life keeps us steadfast and stable in the straight and narrow way and from drifting off and back into the world again. Then in verse number 5, we see unity of authority in that there is one Lord. Jesus said, And why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Luke 6, verse 46. All authority hath been given unto Jesus Christ, both in heaven and on earth, Matthew 28 and verse 18. And all that we do in word or deed, we are to do in the name of the Lord Jesus, that is, by his authority, giving thanks to God and the Father by him, Colossians 3, 17. And the only way that we can do anything by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ is to do it according to the New Testament of Christ to abide in the teaching or the doctrine of Christ. My friends tonight, the Bible says there is salvation only in one name. That is the name of Jesus Christ. Not Allah or not some other false god. But Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven 
given among men whereby we must be saved. No other name. And the only name that we need in order to be sound and scriptural, in order to authorize what we do in the sight of God as being right, is the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. One name. Not two names. Not sixty names. Brethren, one, the name of Jesus Christ. That's the only name. And then we have unity of doctrine. That's the one faith. We are to contend for the one faith delivered unto the saints. Jude verse 3. That is the faith that we are to preach. Galatians 1 verse 23. The faith that is to be obeyed. Acts 6 and 7. We are to strive together in one mind for the faith of the gospel. Philippians 1 and verse number 27. And then we have unity of practice. One baptism. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life, Romans 6 and 4. That is to go down into the water, to be buried in the water, to be raised up out of the water, as the Ethiopian unit was in Acts 8, 38 and 39. And for the purpose of remission of sins, Acts 2 and verse 38. In Acts 8, in verse number 12, the Samaritans knew something of the name of Christ. They knew his authority, didn't they? The Samaritans knew something of the church, the kingdom of God. And they knew the plan of salvation when they had Christ preached to them in Acts 8 and verse 5. Because verse 12 says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the name, concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. The one faith produces the one mind and the same practice in religion. And the last of all, in verse number 6, that is the last, not the end of the lesson, of course, but the end of this passage, there is one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all. 1 Corinthians 8, 6 declares that there is one God and Father and one Lord Jesus Christ. The Father seeks true worshipers to worship him according to Jesus in John 4, 23. And God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, John 4, verse 24. Spirit that is sincerely, earnestly, from the heart, with the spirit of man, and in truth, according to God's word, which is the truth, John 17, verse 17. Now let's make a few applications. You know, over Genesis chapter 11, the people tried to circumvent God's command. Go throughout the earth and to multiply. They wanted to make a name for themselves and build themselves a tower unto heaven. They built the Tower of Babel there in Genesis 11. God confounded their tongues, and therefore we have the expression Babel, confusion, many different languages. We have people today that are trying to circumvent God's will regarding unity. Now I'm not saying that all of these are necessarily intending to do that, but that is the effect of what they're doing. Perhaps some are doing so in ignorance. But let's think about this point. It's a very crucial point as we think about unity, God's unity plan, and the seven ones. It's all or none. We can't have two or three of the ones, or four or five, or even six. We have to have all seven. It's an all or none situation. Now, do we think that anyone could come into Christ without any one of the seven ones of Ephesians 4, 4 to 6? Can anyone come into unity with God and the faithful without having even one of these seven ones? Without the one baptism? Without the one faith? Or the one Lord or the one God or the one Spirit? Can we leave out any of them? I want to read an interview, this was back in 2006, 
with the Christian Chronicle interviewing uh, Phil Sanders, well-known preacher on lectureships and writer, uh, featured writer in the New Think magazine, signer of the AP support statement, speaks uh, Fried Hardman, writes and spiritual sword, etc., etc. Uh, how do we win our brothers back? Proverbs 18, 19. Remember, this is the 100th anniversary of the official delineation on the part of the U.S. Census Bureau between the disciples and the Church of Christ and the chronicle called the Christian Chronicle is really making an all-out effort to bring some kind of unity between the Lord's Church and the Christian Church. So that's the context of what Phil is saying, our brothers. We will not do this by ignoring each other. Well, I agree we don't need to ignore them. Let's go try to get them to repent, tell them the truth. We will win some brothers back the way we lost them, one at a time. We must talk at some point and pray at some point. This is not the time for name calling but rather for calling on his name. Well, beloved, we need to pray to the Lord if that's what he's talking about. Certainly we need to pray for the lost and those in error, but we can pray night and day, but if they're not willing to repent of their error, then we cannot have unity with them. He said, we treat our brothers as brothers even when there is a disruption in fellowship, 2 Thessalonians 3, 14 to 15. So he's considering people of the Christian church as brothers. He said, one sister in the Christian church I taught about musical instruments had never heard the reasons why we don't use them. Once she learned the reasons, she gladly embraced the truth. We did not, or we didn't rebaptize her. We embraced her on her repentance. Many of our own do not know why we oppose instruments, because we have not taught them. Teaching with love is always the answer. If after we have taught we find little change, let us try again. Perhaps we can find reconciliation. We pray we can, yet with great regret at some point we have to accept that we may never win our brother. Well, friends, how can a person who has a corrupt understanding of the one faith, and I'm talking about people who are taught by the Christian church, and have a corrupt view of worship, that takes away the unity of worship right there. How can they be taught wrong and baptized right? This is to imply that they found unity with God based on Christian church teaching. But now let us move on. The one body, the one faith, the one God and Father of all, is also something that is being denied by implication. This is another Christian Chronicle interview. And it's entitled, Dialogue, A Conversation with Royce Money. You know, that's a very fitting name for a president of what's supposed to be a Christian college, isn't it? Money, or a so-called Christian college. But anyway, this... Dr. Money says, he said, Ross Money never understood why his grandparents worshiped at different churches. His grandfather, W.G. Whitlow, attended the instrumental First Christian Church, while his grandmother never missed services at the Acapella 7th and Avenue G Church of Christ. He said, I didn't understand why that had to be then, and I still don't understand now, said Money, president of Abilene Christian University, a 5,000 student university associated with Acapella Churches of Christ for 100 years. As a teenager, Money organized joint Sunday night meetings between the youth groups from his grandparents' churches. So he's been at compromise for a long time, hasn't he? Nearly 50 years later, he recently invited Don Jeans, president of Milligan College, a 1,000 student Tennessee college associated with instrumental Christian churches to help him open the ACU lectureship. He said, I guess it's in my DNA. Well, Dr. Money, don't blame God 
for your spineless efforts to unify the Lord's church with Aaron. Don't blame him. Don't blame it on your DNA. And of course, true if true Christians, faithful Christians, are operating these schools, then their raising of money and everything they do would be in an honorable way. And the doctrine that they would teach and they would practice. But now there is a new so-called unity and diversity movement afoot today. It's new in that there are brethren who were once sound, who have a name for soundness, and once sound congregations and schools and preachers or elders are involved in it. The new movement says or implies one may condemn a doctrine, but not the teacher of it. Or he may condemn the false doctrine and the teacher thereof, but continue in fellowship with those who promote the false teacher or who defend him and uphold him. It disregards 2 John 9 through 11. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed, for he that biddeth them Godspeed is partaker of his evil deeds. Beloved, let us think of it this way. A person does not have to teach overt error in order to violate 2 John 9 through 11. A person may teach the truth with their mouth, but yet disregard God's law and fellowship, fellowship in 2 John, and therefore also go onward and transgress the doctrine of Jesus Christ. The, unit, the new unit of university movement also says that we can't really know how to apply God's law and fellowship. This has even been said by brethren. Well, we just don't know how far to take God's law and fellowship. What does this say about God and his commands? It says that we cannot really know. But Jesus said that we can know. This afternoon in the open forum, we had some individuals here who in essence said, well, we just can't really know whether Elder R&R is a false doctor or not. Can we not know? Jesus said in Matthew 7, 20, Wherefore by their fruits ye shall know them. Brother Keeble used to say, well, I'm just a fruit inspector. And that's what we have to do is inspect fruits in the light of God's Word. The Bible says that we can know. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. 1 John 2 and verse 3. Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. My friends, tonight one of the great concerns that I have in this matter is that we have some preachers coming on today and leaders in congregations, and you know the road that they are heading in is agnosticism. That's always the end of compromise. Agnosticism. That doesn't mean necessarily they're agnostics about belief in God. But agnosticism in regard to what the Bible teaches. In other words, we cannot really know. And when we begin to travel down the road of agnosticism, we find that our gate of fellowship just keeps getting wider and wider. And the things that we practice in religion get more and more loose. But then here's another element of the new unity and diversity. It says you have to go talk to the errorist first. And we've been told this regarding Brother Miller. Well, have you talked today? Go talk today. Have you talked to David? Well, have we talked to him? Some people have talked to him. But brethren, we don't have to talk to an individual to know whether what he is teaching is right or wrong or not. When we look at what a congregation or a school or any group is preaching or teaching or practicing, we don't have to go have a personal interview with them in order to know whether their fruits in the keeping, their fruits in keeping with God's word or not. 
Now, I brought something with me tonight that I transcribed back in Tennessee. This is from the 1980 Open Forum at Freed Hardeman College, in which Brother Guy N. Woods was the moderator. I want to bring some context into this. Brethren of Memphis School of Preaching and GBN, these are the ones saying, now go talk to Dave and have you talk to Dave and this kind of thing. GBN has named a room after Brother Guy in Woods at their facility. Now, I ask you tonight, would Brother Woods go along with this idea that you have to go talk to the person who is teaching the thing? The question was asked Brother Woods. Have you been to Crossroads and talked with the elders about the philosophy of the Crossroads Church? If not, don't you think it would be good to investigate their work before condemning it? Brother Woods, Brother Woods replied, Well, I haven't been to hell either. That doesn't mean I can't condemn the devil. I haven't been to the Vatican, but that doesn't mean I can't condemn the Pope. I haven't been to see the Atollah, well, that was Iran. That doesn't mean I can't condemn Islamic religion. This idea that a person has to go and talk to somebody that is sponsoring error in order to comply with biblical teaching is a gross misapprehension of biblical teaching. Now, there are those that cite the Lord's statement that if you have ought against your brother, go to him and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he will not hear you, take two or three with you. If he won't hear them, tell it to the church. I would point out this, that this has to do with personal difficulties. That is when there is friction between brethren, but when it involves false teaching, when it involves matters that are leading to the division of the, of the church and the alienation of families, and so on, it's absurd and ridiculous to say that such principles apply. All this is is simply an apology for such and an implication that a person cannot condemn error unless he has been in contact with the errors. If that were true, one couldn't preach against the doctrine of the impossibility of apostasy without contacting all the Baptist preachers. You couldn't preach against sprinkling without going to see the Methodists and the Catholics and the Episcopalians and so on. Then he said, how ridiculous can you get? Pretty ridiculous, isn't it? Paul said, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ but their own belly and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Now, as we conclude this evening, God's unity plan is powerful and beautiful indeed. When the early church in Jerusalem were unified and walking in the light and obedient to the Lord, they were of one heart and one soul, Acts 4.32. They had all things common there in Acts chapter 2 and in Acts 4. They ate their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. They were going from house to house. They were continuing steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And do you know what? The world believed on the Son of God because of that. Just as Jesus said that they would. They may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I, and thee thou also may be one in us that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Verse 47 indicates this. They were praising God and having favor with all the people. And verse 47 seals up the point. The Lord added to the church daily such should be saved. The world will believe when we practice God's unity plan. Before we close, I want us to think about one more thing. In 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Peter speaks of those who are of like precious faith. And that's one of the blessings of being here at spring this week, being with those of like precious faith. Think about this. You can go out here to George Bush Intercontinental Airport tomorrow. You can get on a plane to Africa or India or Russia or the Philippines or China. 
You can find people of different color skin than you with a different language from a completely different culture. But if they are abiding in the doctrine of Jesus Christ, loving him and keeping his commandments, John 14, 15, you will be more at home with them and enjoy a greater closeness with them than even among people today who claim to be sound and faithful but who are now practicing compromise. People who may look just like us, be from the same culture, the same socioeconomic class, and even wear the name Church of Christ when they're built. And may preach many things that are true, but yet who are not standing for God's unity plan and standing up for God's law and fellowship who are not abiding in the doctrine of Christ. We're just not of the same mind anymore. But yet we can go and be with people completely different than we are in the earthly sense and physically. But yet if we speak the same thing and be of the same mind, the same judgment, of the same love, like-minded, of one mind, having the mind of Christ, Philippians 2, 1, 2, and 5, Walking by the same rule, Philippians 3.16. Oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Thank you.